do it. So I'm going to follow up that nice presentation with something that I think there's a, has some like mixed data and like the literature is a little bit all over the place. First, uh, thank you, Dr. Torsello, for the introduction and uh, Dr. McKinsey for the invitation to speak. I have no disclosures. Penetrating aortic ulcers belongs to the whole category of acute aortic syndrome, along with which there's classic dissection, that's the true and false lumen with the intimal flap, intramural hematoma in which there's thrombosed blood within the wall of the aorta itself, uh, and then penetrating aortic ulcer. As we all know, aortic dissection, we've already heard it from a couple other speakers, present with acute chest and back pain, is thought to be due to an intimal medial tear uh, that generates into an intimal flap, resulting in a patent false lumen, which often has multiple reentry sites, which is going to pressurize that lumen and potentially cause uh, renal, visceral, and lower extremity malperfusion, as due to hypertension, which is really the main cause of it. Intramural hematoma will present clinically similar to patients with aortic dissection. They can present with chest and back pain in the majority of the cases, and they comprise 5 to 30 percent of all acute aortic syndromes. The definition that radiologists will often follow is hematoma within the wall when you have 7, mm, seven millimeters of thickness in the wall is defined as an intramural hematoma. Now, the patients are a different subset than the aortic dissection patients. Dissection patients don't often have atherosclerosis, will often present with really bad hypertension. But patients who present with penetrating ulcers and intramural hematomas are the typical atherosclerotic uh, patients that have the same kind of risk factors. The thoughts about etiology has changed. Initially, the thought was that there was spontaneous rupture of a vasovasorum in the media, which leads to generation of an intramural hematoma. The thought process over the past couple of years has changed then to uh, the intramural hematoma being preceded by a penetrating ulcer or intimal medial tear, which allows access of blood to flow into that aortic wall. And penetrating ulcer, which you can kind of see in this picture, which is a little outpouching in the uh, aorta, uh, is erosion of atheromatous mural plaque into the aortic wall. The calcium cuts into that aortic segment, and there's contrast-filled pouch-like protrusion of the aorta into the thickened aortic wall in the absence of an intimal flap or false lumen. And oftentimes, the radiologist will use the definition of three millimeters from the intimal surface uh, as being a ulcerated plaque. The Mayo Clinic had their study where they looked at majority of the patients with PAUs, and 80% of them actually had associated intramural hematomas, which, if you think about it pathophysiologically, kind of makes sense. One of the biggest literature uh, that we have is from the IRAD experience, the multicenter registry of acute aortic syndromes. You've heard people refer to that already a couple times today. They looked at 1,010 patients in their registry, and 58 of them had intramural hematomas, 5.7%. Compared to the patients who present with dissection, these patients are older, 68.7 years on average versus 61, had more distal pathology, whereas most of the dissections present in the ascending aorta. More intramural hematomas happen in the descending aorta, uh, but the overall mortality was similar across the groups. When you looked at patients who died from intramural hematomas uh, based on the site of origin, it's kind of what you would expect. Patients who had pathology in the ascending aortas were more prone to death in the hospital, 60%, 50%, 33%, compared to patients who presented with descending pathology, 7 13%. Another study uh, looked at patients who had intramural hematomas, prospectively followed them to see what happens to them over time. Uh, and with a mean follow-up of 45 months, they had 68 intramural hematomas, 12 in the type A in the ascending aortas, 56 in the type B. And you can see about half the patients in the acute phase when they presented required surgical repair. Only two of the 56 went on to surgical repair. Of note, both of the patients who went to surgical repair from the type B group ended up dying. Two out of the six ended up dying from the type A group. Of the patients that they watched in the type A group, five out, three out of the five patients progressed to early surgery within the first three months, two because of progression to a type A dissection, and one because of progression to a fusiform aneurysm. Uh, and overall, from all the patients with type A that they ended up watching, only one survived in the long term. This is in, in contrast to patients who have type B pathology where 42 out of the 56 survived. So it kind of gives you an idea what kind of acuity it is based on location. It's important to know that intramural hematomas and penetrating aortic ulcer is a, is a diagnosis and pathology that evolves over time. When they, another study by Evangelista in Circulation 2003 looked at 50 patients who initially presented with an intramural hematoma, and the, the aorta morph, the morphology changes over time. 15 of them actually went on to full regression with return to normal aorta, where 20 of them went on to dissection, and 15 of them went on to aortic dilatation. 
Of the patients who had dissection, you can see that 12 of them developed a pseudoaneurysm locally in the area where they had the defect, uh, and six of them went on to classical dissection. What's notable is that 27 out of 50 of these patients, more than half these patients went on to develop aneurysmal or pseudoaneurysmal changes within that segment of the aorta that was abnormal. Uh, and small aortic diameter was predictor of regression, absence of area or ulcerated plaque at that location was a pr prognostic factor for development into an aneurysm. Uh, Song et al. looked at type A intramural hematomas and looked for imaging characteristics to decide which patients are going to die. It looks like a lot of them die. Which are the, which are the ones that we can predict will die? Uh, and hematoma thickness greater than 11 millimeters and maximal aortic diameter at time of diagnosis greater than 48 millimeters were highly uh, relevant to uh, event-free survival. Uh, CT angiography is probably what we use the most today. It's quick. You can identify the intimal flap, presence of an intramural hematoma, access the entire aorta and side branches, and you get rapid data, data acquisition. And also can give you size and length measurements uh, for endovascular therapy. But really, probably the best one, if we could get it on everyone, would be a trans, uh, transesophageal echo. It really visualizes that whole segment of aorta the best. It can di visualize the intima very well, differentiate mural thrombus from intramural hematoma, which is often the most challenging part of this kind of diagnosis. How do you know that the hematoma that you see is not just thrombus that's within the intralumen versus true intra, uh, intramural thrombus? And you know, TE does a good job of showing that to you that you can see here. Um, some cases, this was a patient, uh, 83 years old, with a uh, history of CHF that presented with five days of back pain, new onset AFib, and persistent pain despite blood pressure control. And on CAT scan, you could see this ulcerated, penetrating aortic ulcer here. This wasn't blood, but this was a reactive effusion that was in the lung on that side. Um, and because the patient, despite blood pressure control, uh, ended up having persistent pain, we ended up stent grafting her. It's, it's a little hard to see and how it's projected here. And her pain resolved after, immediately immediately after uh, repair with the stent graft. A similar patient, 85-year-old end-stage renal disease with three days of back pain, the patient actually developed uh, acute onset hypotension while the patient was in dialysis, got an acute CAT scan, and this is fresh blood, and this is someone who ruptured into, uh, ruptured their penetrating aortic ulcer and required urgent uh, emergent stent graft repair, and you can see that in this patient's angiogram, you have this alpagin that you could see. We're able to put one stent graft piece in, and the patient did quite well after that. Uh, this was with our um, cardiothoracic colleagues, 85-year-old female with substernal chest pain. And this is kind of where the imaging on CAT scan is, is, doesn't do so great. Uh, you can see that there's maybe, you can call this a focal dissection. You could potentially call this a um, you know, penetrating ulcer. You could see a defect in that ascending thoracic aorta. And then it's unclear really what's going on in the periaortic space because on the CAT scan it's not very clear. Uh, and this patient was taken emergently to the OR based on that flap alone. Intraoperative TE was initially negative, but the second kind of look around at that area, the patient developed pericardial fluid uh, and uh, subsequent tamponade requiring pericardial diffusion. And when this patient was finally repaired, you could see that there was this defect, that same kind of defect you saw in the CAT scan, along with the associated intramural hematoma. And retrospective kind of review of this imaging shows that this probably was a large intramural hematoma that was starting to develop in this area. So the real challenge when we talk about when should we fix a PAU is that we don't really have good answers to, is my patient's symptoms due to this penetrating aortic ulcer? A lot of the times it's chest and back pain. It's sometimes nonspecific pain. So it's a kind of a diagnostic challenge to be like, this radiologic finding is related to my patient's symptoms. And then the other thing that we talked about is a lot of the times you see it on imaging, but is this a penetrating aortic ulcer or irregular intraluminal thrombus is kind of difficult to answer. This being said, I think there are some guidelines that we do like to follow. Unstable patient with a rupture or tamponade, that's easy. This patient requires an emergent repair. Persistent pain despite medical management. Medical management with anti-impulse therapy, even though hypertension is not the primary cause, still should be getting medical management. Uh, and then other kind of secondary factors to look for. Large intramural hematoma greater than 11 millimeters. Large aortic diameter greater than 50 millimeters. Second si secondary signs of acuity, including periaortic and pleural effusion, might be beneficial. Incidentally found PAUs just in an asymptomatic patient should be observed. Patients with intramural hematoma should be followed though uh, if there is no regression because we've seen that a lot of them, more than 50% of them can develop into an aneurysm or a pseudoaneurysm. Thank you very much.